friends, welcome back to my channel. Today we have a special guest, Tilani Virya Surya, a PhD student who is pursuing blockchain technology from University of Western Sydney in Australia. So today we are going to talk about her journey as a PhD student and where she came from and how she's finding her course so far. Welcome, Tilani. And um, you, Tantashi. <laughs> It's been a while and I know Tilini through a Toastmasters club and she's, I'm telling you, she's a very good speaker. So we have been, we have been friends for a couple of years now and I requested her to be on our channel to share her experience as a PhD student. And thank you so much for giving your time, Tilini. Thank and you for inviting me, Sandashi. It's a <laughs> pleasure to talk with you and to share my experiences with the broader public and anyone who is interested in pursuing a journey in like doing their PhD. That's awesome. And today I'm, I'm going to ask you like very, uh, you know, basic questions and just to tell about yourself, what you used to do before arriving in Australia and how you got into PhD. Okay, so I graduated with a bachelor's honors degree in management and information technology from the University of Kalania, Sri Lanka. I had first class honors and then I worked for a year as a temporary lecturer in the University of Kalania. After that, I got a job as a probationary lecturer in the University of Moratua, Sri Lanka. When I was an undergraduate, I was inspired by my lecturers and professors, and I decided I wanted to pursue a career in academia rather than going into the industry after graduation. So to progress as an academic, you need to have a PhD. And we are encouraged to pursue our doctoral studies abroad so that we can gain a broader exposure to cutting edge research and knowledge. So I was always interested in traveling to Australia and New Zealand. So I started looking for PhD opportunities in this area, uh, in this part of the world. So usually when you apply for your doctoral program, you need to have identified a principal supervisor, a potential supervisor who would then continue working with you on your degree. So I was introduced to Professor Srinath Pereira at Western Sydney University, who is currently my principal supervisor. So I was introduced to him by a colleague at my uh, university, University of Moratua. I told him that I'm interested in researching topics uh, related to application of information technology in interdisciplinary areas, because that was my passion where it's rather than going deep into technology, the workings of the technology, I wanted to look at how this technology can be applied in different areas. So Professor Pereira is the director for the Center for Smart Modern Construction in Western Sydney University. And this center is all about, uh, it's an industry collaboration initiative where they have uh, embraced smart technologies and processes to deliver a modern construction industry. So I submitted a research proposal to Professor Pereira on the application of IT in construction, and he agreed to be my supervisor. So that, that's I, wonderful. That's yeah. really wonderful. And how, what, what was the visa process after that, after it's been approved from uh, Professor Pereira? So once I got uh, the supervisor approval, I applied to the programs, like to the university. Uh, as a normal, I follow the normal application process uh, where I had to give all my uh, educational qualifications and other details, and then um, also had to uh, submit my IELTS results. And to get into a doctoral program, I believe you have to have a minimum of at least 6.5 or 7. Um, I think it's 7. Um, it, it's been quite a while. So all that information is anyway available on university websites. So you just need to uh, do your research, like your preliminary research when you want to start on this program. And if I remember rightly, yeah, so when I was studying for IELTS, although I am relatively fluent in English, I did do a lot of practice because I wasn't sure what sort of uh, questions would be given to me and then I did a lot of practice exams before I went for the exam and I felt quite confident at the time when I 
face the exam. So I actually received uh, 8.5 band score in IELTS. So wow. that was quite an achievement for me at that time. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Even now it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 8.5 out of nine. Oh my goodness, that's really, really a good score. So you didn't have any problem in um, IELTS then. So it was a pretty much a smooth flow. Uh, yes, and yeah. uh, yes, so once I put in all my documentation, the university took a bit of time to process the application, and then I got um, around a month or two later, I, I was offered a placement at the university, and then I had to provide, like I had to pay for the initial semester, for the first semester registration because I hadn't been able to, I had actually applied for a scholarship at the university, a research scholarship, but um, due to like, uh, at the time it was very competitive. So I didn't get the first sem the scholarship in the first semester. I only got it from the second semester onwards. So I had to uh, put in some personal funds to uh, fund my initial scholarship. And I also was awarded a partial scholarship from Sri Lanka to fund a certain amount of my expenses. So that was helpful. So the partial scholarship was from your uh, university in Sri Lanka? Yes, so there was a program called the AHEAD operation, which was focusing on providing scholarships for uh, probationary lecturers in state universities in Sri Lanka. And they had a maximum amount, which was when you convert it into Australian dollars, it was less than even 40% of the, uh, the total cost for a year. But then I had to, I borrowed some money from my mom as well. And <laughs> then uh, managed to pay the initial, like the first semester fees and show that I had funds for, to live in Australia for a year. And then once I came here, I was on a very tight budget at the start and I was hoping to start working at doing some part-time work once I arrived. But luckily my scholarship application was rolled over to the second semester and I was, uh, I was lucky enough to get that scholarship at the time. So now I have a full fee waiver and a stipend as well, a living stipend for three years. So to get that research scholarship, the requirements were, were you need to show your academic qualifications and uh, when you have a master's degree you get additional points a bachelor's with an honors degree will also, uh, an honors degree with the uh, first class will also get some points and so on and you need to show research output that is publications journal papers conference papers book chapters all of those have been allocated different uh, levels of marks so when you apply for a scholarship, always look into those requirements and all of the information is clearly available on university websites. So again, do your research and see what you need to do in order to gain a scholarship. Uh, so yeah, you always need to do some preliminary research. On that. That's awesome. And yeah, that, that's really good. So you, you had a bit of guidance back home that to do all those all these type of you know procedure sort of things to approach the universities in Australia and you got some leads from there isn't it and that yes. made your life easy and as as well as like you got that uh, all all credentials that's required for that application as well so that that made your life a bit easy in that regard so hopefully I mean I'm, I'm guessing it because first semester still you had to pay isn't it yes <laughs> that was coming yes. from uh, from out of your pocket and from second semester, it's fully uh, sponsored, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. And uh, Tilini, after coming here as a PhD student, as you said already, like you got five, eight point five. You may not have that much, you know, and at all difficulty at all, you know, talking to people. But what else? What are the other challenges you had when you arrived uh, to Australia? When I arrived in Australia. I think I was very lucky because I managed to come to a research group which had a lot of Sri Lankans in it. Oh. So I was pretty much, I went 
came from Sri Lanka into a community of Sri Lankans. <laughs> it helped me a lot because they gave me a full or orientation on what I need to do. They took me to the bank and I, they helped me get a bank account and a phone, uh, like a mobile connection and everything. And of course, uh, I was feeling homesick because that was the first time I ever left home for a long period of time. But being in that community was very helpful. And I also uh, lived in the uh, university residence, the uh, student village, which is also great because I'm uh, living in a five bedroom apartment and having other students around me, even from different fields. Yeah, so there are undergraduates and master's students and PhD students, like we have a whole mix of students in the residence. And that's also that also helped reduce my level of homesickness. Uh, in terms of culture shock, it was more of being impressed by how things work in Australia. It seems to be more efficient and things happen so smoothly compared to back home. Although, of course, I love my country and it is, uh, but it is a great uh, difference in terms of how things happen. And you feel like, okay, you can just uh, manage on your own because everything's just available right around you. So you have your supermarkets, you have uh, like you've got gyms and everything just ready to be accessed, especially if you live in a, an urban area. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I agree with you. And I have to tell you a small um, sort of a story, not really a story. One of my cousins uh, lives in Melbourne and when I was uh, planning to come to Australia and she said, Santoshi, are you going to Sydney? Sydney is like a city of Mumbai. It's very crowded and, you know, very busy. But when I came here, I felt like very empty roads. Like, you know, city of Mumbai was like, you know, really, really crowded. But at the time, I didn't feel that. I felt like, oh, it doesn't seem like that, you know, like as busy as Mumbai. But I felt like, oh, everything is reachable with any, any amenities are close by. So... I felt like very, very handy for that purpose, but I don't know about Mumbai, I haven't been there, but Hyderabad was much crowded than, you know, than, um, than, than Sydney city. Yeah, so yeah, I know how you would have felt after coming here from a, a populated country <laughs> to Australia. And Tindini, as a master's student, I came to Australia as a master's student. So master's is something like where you attend college or university for three days or two days, depending on your, you know, um, lectures. And then, um, yeah, just do your assignments and test whatever is being uh, given as per the schedule or semester schedule. But would that be any difference for a PhD student in that terms? Well, the PhD is usually when you enroll for a PhD, it's a full time program and you are expected to put in at least 35 hours of work per week. But of course, it is way more than 35 hours you, because you have to be focused on the research and just keep on reading, writing and trying different things and then discussing with your supervisors, also discussing with your peers. If you have people uh, in a research team, if there are people around you, then it's all about discussions. And the center that I work for, uh, I work in, uh, is also involved in industry activities. So we organize industry workshops and forums. So the PhD candidates in the center are the ones who do all the legwork. So we have to help out in all of these activities. So they're spearheaded by uh, Professor Pereira, who then uh, he has a lot of projects going on. So it's not just the PhD that we get involved in, it's a number of other things. So managing your time is something really important. So having the scholarship helps because I don't think I would have been able to do a part-time job, like uh, focus on a job that would help me live and work at the same time. But there are students who do that and I admire their capability, their strength to work on both of those activities at the same time. Uh, I do do a bit of teaching, uh, casual teaching at the university. So I have one subject each semester where I have a few hours per semester because it's a shared subject. So that helps me supplement my income. Uh, but uh, 
living on the scholarship alone is also possible if you manage your expenses. So, but focusing on the work, so compared to masters, you don't have any course in Western, you don't have any coursework to follow. You just have to work on the research. So the PhD goes as, so initially you will submit a, a proposal and then that goes into, uh, you have, to face something called a confirmation of candidature, where you have to defend your proposal uh, in front of a panel of uh, academic staff, and also there can be external examiners as well. So they will, you have a 15 minute presentation and then you have to face a lot of questions from the panel to ensure that you have identified the proper problem and to make sure that you know what you want to do. It's not a given that you have to follow the path that you proposed in the COC or the confirmation of candidature, but it because research changes when you go on one down one path, sometimes it may not be the correct thing to do or it may not be possible. So you have to backtrack and do some other changes and then go forward. But the main thing is to know your problem that is actually a problem to be solved and to know that uh, no at least roughly how you will solve it so yeah so Goodness. this is yeah this is very challenging it looks like very challenging to me and uh, even if i had to do it uh, i may not be <laughs> interested to do that way it looks really intense isn't it it's um, very intense that you have to keep on working on your research and make sure that it's going in the right path and you're yes. identifying uh, solutions for the problems that you uh, identified so it's it's really, really, um, yeah, intense program then. Yes, and you also need to take ownership because it is your PhD. So your supervisors are there to guide you and support you. And But still, at the end of the day, it is your project and it has to be self-directed. So sometimes I struggle with focusing because I tend to get distracted by other things. But then at the end of the day, you have to work on the study because that is what you are here to do so yeah okay, that's right and how uh, how often do you have your presentations like how do you know whether you're tracking okay or with your research yes so i usually have a progress meeting with my supervisors every fortnight or every three weeks depending on the tasks that have been decided to be done within that time period and so i have to show what i have done and then discuss any issues and then we usually talk for about one hour or one and a half hours depending on how much content there is to cover and oh. I have been again very lucky in having a very supportive uh, panel. So Professor Srinath Pereira and Dr. Rodrigo Calheros are my supervisors and they are also very invested in the project and provide a lot of guidance. I've heard certain say horror stories, not horror stories exactly, but stories from other PhD candidates in other areas sometimes where they don't really get that much of support. So it's like you have to go after the supervisor asking for questions and asking for a meeting and stuff. But then my supervisors, like at the end of, to say I have a meeting today, at the end of that meeting, I would uh, then be given another meeting date so that uh, the, everybody's calendar is blocked and we know that, okay, we have a uh, fixed point to work towards so and having supervisor support in a PhD is essential I mean it is very useful to make your journey easier yeah I think you're you're lucky in that regards and also depends on the candidate as well sometimes like if you show interest towards that project I think um, it, it has to be a balance between the candidate and the supervisor as well so I think that right balance has is working well for you with your supervisors and you. So that's really good. And Tilini, you also mentioned that you're working as a casual, um, you're working in a casual employment. How did you get that opportunity? Again, that was through my supervisor. So he suggested that I work on uh, this particular subject uh, last semester and then uh, so I just uh, I applied through the university so that it's uh, you have this uh, internal portal where you have to apply uh, to be an academic and then if you have your supervisor support and then if you uh, they will again assess your 
uh, qualifications to conduct the subject uh, and the university offered me the position. So okay, so that's how you got it. You went into the portal and applied. And yes, yes. You got your so, supervisor's reference as well, so that made it easy for you to get into that casual employment. Yeah, yeah that's good. And uh, yeah, we've been we've been talking about your PhD course, but what is your specialization? What you're working on? What's the technology that you're using? Yes, so my project is on blockchain technology for the construction industry. Um, so it's a very long topic. So I will read it out because <laughs> <laughs> I tend to trip on a few words as well. So my exact topic is uh, developing a blockchain-based post-contract work and payment certification framework for construction projects. So it's a very long topic, but in yeah. short, it is... Uh, a blockchain framework that can track and analyze all quality and progress certifications and their related payments in a construction project. This is aimed at ensuring compliance in the industry and reducing the incidence of building failures. So what I'm currently doing is interviewing construction consultants, such as project managers, architects, engineers, quantity surveyors, and so on in order to identify all the certification processes. And now I am designing a software model which will be more efficient and connect all of these different parties into an integrated system. So currently in construction, what happens is different stakeholders do their activities separately and there isn't that much communication um, in general. So mm -hmm. there is a tendency that things can be mislaid or they may not be able to track everything easily. So with blockchain, so this is not a financial application, it's a non-financial application of blockchain where you can use it to create a database which will be persistent. So that data will be there right throughout the lifetime of the project and beyond. And if it is a system that is shared among different organizations in the, in the industry, then you can just track the performance of all the contractors and the consultants within the industry. So that's like the long-term goal that we can have an integrated system for the entire industry so that we can have more reliable contractors and consultants working towards ensuring that buildings do not really fail and we just have uh, more compliance in the industry. Wow, that's really, really a oh, big project. It looks like integrating the whole uh, industry and then trying to, you know, get everything in streamlining the processes within the construction sector. That's yeah, really so, yeah. Yeah. So just to clarify, so I won't be creating that entire real world system. It's going to be a prototype. Okay. And uh, in a PhD research, we when we start a PhD, we think, okay, we are going to aim for a Nobel Prize. But what we are told is, no, it's not a Nobel Prize winning uh, thesis. It will be usually if the state of the art is here, we are moving it just a little step further upwards. So we're just pushing the boundary of knowledge a little further. Of course, there are projects that go really well and they just uh, go and improve in the state of the art in leaps and bounds. But if you go aiming so high, sometimes it might be a bit overwhelming. So Kaizen is the way to go, continuous improvement step-by-step, step. just uh, think that, okay, we'll push the boundary a little further and try to, so that someone else can work on your work and yeah. push it further as well. So okay, so they can take from your step and then they can go a bit further up. Yes, okay. So, so what I hope to achieve is uh, like the software framework and that uh, the models of the data so that it can be improved into an actual system in the future. So that could be a commercial project which the university runs later on. That's really awesome. I don't want to go in detail because I'm a technology <laughs> sort of person. But yeah, that looks really interesting that what you're working on. And 
and it, the PhD students like uh, how what do you think what skill set is required for a PhD student from your perspective like for example uh, like you would have any time any time did you ever thought that oh thank god I've got this skill so that's why I make I'm you know doing it uh, very well or at least I'm up to that stage where I can understand it what is happening around me if I didn't have this skill it would have been a struggle for me so is there any sort of things that you thought uh, or you think that a PhD student um, should have yes so PhD students should have a whole bag of skills that they need to pick and choose from from time to time the main thing is perseverance the program can be challenging. It is challenging most of the time. It's intellectually challenging. And because of that, it's physically exhausting as well because you're seated in one place and you're working your mind and just trying to figure out what to do next. So to get through those challenges, you have to persevere and work hard. And you need to be determined to complete this somehow. And you also need to be resilient. Sometimes what the, the path that you go down may not be the correct path, as I mentioned before. And if you reach a dead end, you need to just go back and just not be too beat up about it because uh, that didn't work. Okay, now what do I do? It's the end of the world. No, it's not. You can uh, have a rework because in a PhD, finding out that something doesn't work is also a finding because now somebody else need not follow that path and that incorrect path because they know it can't be done. So you can uh, say that is a finding. So everything that you do in the research has to be written and uh, explained. And writing is a skill that you need because you, everything that you do has to be explained clearly for the examiners. In Australia, most of the universities, as I believe do not have a viva that is a, an oral presentation on oral examination. So your three to four years of work has to be presented in a way that uh, it is understood by the examiners and also sh you show the examiners that you have done a significant body of work that is accepted in, the, in academia. So being able to publish before you submit the thesis is also an added advantage because then when you have publications, those are peer reviewed and it proves to the examiners that you have done your work and it is accepted by the broader scientific community, the broader research community. Uh, being passionate about the area you are researching is also important because sometimes, again, when things get tough, you need to like what you're doing. Otherwise, <laughs> it will be just... Yeah. A may are just getting through those uh, four years and communication so again written as well as oral communication so you would have certain presentations you have to go and present in conferences so being able to communicate properly is essential and if you are doing some teaching as well that helps in communicating with your students what else being able to have fun is also necessary because it's not all work. If you just work, 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 then you'll be exhausted and you shouldn't really do that. Try to have some fun from time to time, but not get too distracted with fun all the time. <laughs> like I tend to do sometimes, but then you need to be able to turn back and focus. So blocking out some time in your day to relax is necessary exercise. I ensure that I have daily exercise. So I became somewhat of a fitness freak when I came to Australia. So I either do some running or swimming or go to the gym and do some CrossFit. Uh, only one of those activities per day, of course, I'm not <laughs> crazy to do. All that. <laughs> but yes, so have some time to interact with your peers, your friends, uh, and just relax, travel around the country. If you have time, like make time at least half a week, uh, like not half a week, sorry, half a weekend, say Saturday morning or just take your Saturday, uh, go out somewhere and experience the country you live in because you come all the way from a different country to a different country. And then if you don't do, don't experience the culture, the life around you, you might as well have stayed at home and just studied at home, which is, again, uh, just make use of the, like, the opportunities that you have. 
That's true. Yes, that's I totally agree. And those skill sets are very important as well. Like as you mentioned that your communication skills are oral and written communication skills, which I find it very um, hard when I came here. I didn't know how to write assignments. I, I didn't. It was like project based that where we have done in our country in India. But I, I didn't had much sort of like how the assignments really work here. So it was really tough for me because I didn't had good communication skills, oral or written. Yeah, so for PhD students who are planning to study in Australia, ensure that what Tilini has said, perseverance and all other qualities that you, you know, gain to process and especially passionate about the subject that you are planning to do. And these are some of the things that um, may help you when if you have decided to pursue PhD in Australia. And uh, Tilini, one more thing, like, okay, which year you are in now? Is, is there any... This is my uh, third year. Third year, and then you got one more year to finish, is that? Yes, yeah, so my maximum submission date is in four years, but uh, my scholarship ends at the end of my third year, so I need to finish as soon as possible or request for an extension on the scholarship, or I'll have to start working more to get... Uh, my just to cover my living expenses so let's see how it goes and yeah okay so the scholarship is going to be until your uh, last semester and after that you have to self-fund yourself if you haven't finished your thesis by then is that right yeah okay oh that's that's going to be a bit hard anyway you will finish it I have <laughs> confidence in you <laughs> and uh, and what is the future like after you finish your uh, PhD and what would be the uh, career for you what sort of my thing? chosen career is in academia so I want to continue as a lecturer and then finally reach the stage of professor okay. but with a PhD you yeah a lot of people decide to get into academics but I was talking with someone in the industry recently who said that, yes, if you are interested in going into industry, show that you have industry experience along with your PhD. It's not just academics. You know what happens in the industry and sell yourself to the industry. You have a good resume and a cover letter and then be able to prove that you know what you are talking about. So that is important so especially if you're working on areas like blockchain there's a lot of opportunity in the industry as well because it again it's an interdisciplinary area you can apply blockchain projects in any in a lot of areas i believe if it's supply chains if it's uh, logistics and yes yeah, so logistics a lot of different areas have blockchain applications uh, being proposed and you could be one of the founders or a very uh, one of the early starters in this area. And I believe in Australia, it is one of the, um, say, like key areas that the government is also focusing on. So getting into those tech areas will help you go a long way in terms of uh, yeah getting a good job. And also you could even start your own company, I believe. So if you are good in tech, then if you have a good idea that could work as a, a real world system, go for it. So you go, you got lots of opportunities where you can move uh, into different areas as academia or industry, or you can set up your own business. And I have done a video on that as well, how blockchain technology is improving in Australia. So yeah, th those are the things that I have, when I found it, I felt like very amazing. Oh my God, this blockchain technology is like creeping into the system and they're using, as you said, it's like interdisciplinary. It can be used in any field. So that's interesting. And yeah, after... Like as a PhD student, how you're finding in Australia, like uh, coming back from your country, the, obviously you wouldn't have done a PhD course in your country, but the curriculum, the way of, you know, uh, the supervisors and the style of, you know, uh, approaching you, how do you find any difference from the curriculum in uh, Sri Lanka to how the study system is in Australia, Tilini? 
I know it's not it's not a right act question for you, but yeah, how you find it? I think it's the amount of resources that universities here have are much greater than what we have in Sri Lanka because uh, especially when it comes to state universities or government universities in Sri Lanka, so we work on a very limited budget because uh, the budget is allocated by the government and the funding that is available in Australia is I think massive, but it could be better from what I hear, but still comparatively, it's quite a large amount and you have a lot of funding to work on research projects and grants are given and then so PhD students are funded and you get certain amount of funding to go for conferences and publish uh, and publish your research. So, and the programs are also, I think, very well established so they have a very formal process and everything happens relatively smoothly so in terms of processes and funding it's quite efficient and I think uh, much you find a better scope for improvement or scope like a larger pool of experience to like to pick out from yeah, that's right. That's that's really a good thing, isn't it? Having budget helps you to do what you want. Like, you know, in terms of research, it's not like very sort of, you know, fit, very scarcity of budget helps you, doesn't help you anywhere. But yeah, that's really good thing that universities here have a lot of budget for research uh, projects. Yeah, that's good. And um, do you got anything else to add to this? I think we are we pretty much covered funding for PhD and also we covered for IEL how IEL is and also what skills uh, a PhD should, uh, student should have and we pretty much covered. Do you have anything else that you want to really tell that it may help the prospective PhD students or any international student? I think we pretty much covered it, but I believe I should have mentioned ask for help if you are stuck you are not alone the university is there to help you even if you can't access your supervisor or if they're too busy you can always reach out to either the graduate school or there are well-being and support services in all the universities so if you feel like you are lonely or you don't know what to do reach out for help because I did that when I was uh, feeling stuck, especially during COVID, during the lockdowns, I was feeling isolated, even though I lived in my, like with others in the apartment. I was, uh, so I was working in the office uh, all five days of the week, surrounded by researchers. But then during lockdowns, it was just in my room, wondering what's going to happen with COVID and everything. So it was very challenging and being uncertain about whether I could ever fly back home or when I could fly back home. So I reached out to counseling services and I talked with the counselor. So there's no shame in saying that you are struggling and you need uh, help. So I think that mentality is there in our part of the world where we are afraid of admitting weakness and especially when it's uh, mental health. So being aware of those issues is helpful, especially when you are a PhD candidate and uh, there are a lot of uh, services available and make use of those and interact with other students. That is also important because having connections, even if they're not in your same area, just make friends, just go out and get some social time in, in addition to your studies. So I think other than being hardworking, persevering, interact, ask for help and have fun. That is what I would like to end with. That's really true. I was, I was uh, smiling when you said COVID because I really had to struggle with my kids as well at that time. I was like pulling my hair. Oh my God, I have to do my work. And kids being at home, it was like crazy talk. Yes, I remember those days now. Now I laugh at it, but at that time, it was like a crazy moment for every one of us, isn't it? Yes. Indeed. So and he, also, yes, yeah, so I really admire uh, people who study when they have kids. It is amazing. I find it hard to manage things just being on my own, but uh, looking after children and then doing their work and their studies is amazing. So 
<laughs> kudos oh, please yeah please kill me and also um friends i would like to tell you one more thing if if i have any like even now i'm not good at writing but still i approach people i reach out people uh, asking for help like i ask tilini because she's good at her english and i ask my toast masters mentors as well like if i have anything and they're happy to help so don't feel uh, anything for asking help just reach out and people here are very very nice so far i haven't come across any sort of you know um, adverse or any uh, whatever you call it like people not helping you it, i haven't come across anything if you show interest they show double interest to help you out so just reach out and ask for help and um, have fun as tilini said <laughs> So thank you so much Tilini for all your uh, time today and also sharing your experience as a PhD student and also a lecturer in the university so thank you for your time and maybe i might do some other topic on you if, if uh, time permits and until then bye thank you sandeep pleasure <laughs>